How's it going, everybody? Welcome back. Good afternoon. It's uh, three minutes till class time, so we still have a few moments to just kind of get ready, but um, I'm establishing the stream just now. And um, hope you guys had a good weekend, ready to come back and learn a little bit more. So I'll be with everyone as we get the meeting underway in like about uh, two and a half minutes. <clears throat> Hey there, Prue. How's it going? Good afternoon. Good. Good to know. <clears throat> nice sunny weather outside right now, so I always enjoy that. Hey, Preston. How's it going? Good to see you. <clears throat> Hey, Austin. You're present in this universe. Hi, Anthony. Good to see you. Hi, Lauren. <clears throat> I wonder if some of you guys had a little extra time off. Probably not, because maybe you don't have like a meeting schedule that has anything to do with specifically being present on a Monday, but. Uh, some of the places where I teach had President's Day holiday over the weekend, so got a little more time back. Hey, Trevor, good to see you there. <clears throat> okay, just a couple moments and we'll be ready to start. <clears throat> <clears throat> hello, hello. Are you in? <laughs> so, what is this like another kind of like Hindenburg or like? Um, aviation equivalent of the Titanic or whatever, but engineering marvel, marvel. So I mean, in that case, it must have been an impressive piece of architecture or whatever piece of construction, but just didn't actually function. Cool. Well, so much to research in life, and so it's always interesting to gain new new knowledge. Welcome back, everybody. Hi, I see all you guys here, Jonah, Khan, and Preston, all the rest. Um, you know, it's still just twelve forty-five, and so sometimes. People arrive to the meeting a few months beyond the class start, but if you're already here, uh, as usual, feel free to just type in a little comment of some kind, and then that'll be a way for me to know for sure that you're present. Um, so I see you guys all here. Hi, Paul. I see you there. And Mateo, good to see you too. All right, so let's just kind of jump back into our meeting and um, kind of take stock of where we are at right now. You guys have your first homework that's due on Thursday. Don't forget that. Um, I've delivered you guys the instructions. Uh, if you've if you've forgotten those or want to take another look, just remember they're on the Canvas page in the Announcements tab. Uh, so that'll give you a little bit of a detailed breakdown of how to complete the first homework. Uh, I also mentioned it at the tail end of the last class lecture. Um, just so we all know about the class lectures, right? They get posted to the channel, the YouTube academic YouTube channel that I'm using. But all videos take a several hours to upload from the moment that they're first recorded live. So you can't really view them until maybe later on that evening or even the next morning, but they're always going to be posted and archived there. So if, if there's a video with some content that maybe you missed a little part of, never fear if, uh, if it's just after the lecture and uh, you don't see it showing up in the queue yet, because it'll always be posted as soon as it uploads. Uh, these are longer videos, so they do take, in some cases, 8, 10, or 12 hours to, to appear on the page. But anyway, just reminding you, don't forget, homework number one, due on Thursday. You can just email it to me anytime before the start of class time on Thursday. 
and that'll be your first homework on time submitted to me. It's exercise A3. It's on page 252 of the book. There's part one of that exercise. It's part one, A through J. And for further details, you can always refer to those uh, sources that I was just mentioning. So yeah, uh, the other thing too, don't forget this, there's a school holiday for you guys anyway on Thursday. So there's no actual lecture in our class this week, Thursday. So we get a little bit of a break. Um, I'm gonna be attending the, the flex day activities that they put on for faculty members, but that's a, that's not a day of instruction. So anyway, we have one little day off on, on Thursday. Is this letter W to denote the concept that that's a win? Let me know, Noah because I want to catch the reference. But anyway, yeah, so thanks, guys. Just remember, homework's due Thursday. Just send it to me as an email attachment. You're just going to email that to my email address, which is listed in the um, syllabus. Office hours, ooh. You know what, no, I, I don't think that I'll be available to hold my regular office hours on Thursday for the simple reason that I have to do these faculty development activities all day. But anybody who has any need to uh, or desire to to speak with me or to have any issues clarified, um, then then please email me and we'll just be able to find a different time. We can meet by Zoom for any individual student. But my open availability on Thursday? No, yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I understand. Yes, but I mean, is it really a win though? I mean, what are you going to be doing with your time that is so much more interesting and fun than just hanging out at this live live stream on YouTube? I mean, but you probably do have a very interesting and exciting life, so I'm sure no shortage of options. But yeah, I mean, I guess sometimes getting a day off of school, like, oh, it's snowing and so we don't have to go is nice. Um, do I check Canvas messages? Yes, I do check my messages that come in through Canvas, Devin, but uh, just email me usually is, is the best way. I receive them all through my email inbox anyway, so when I check your Canvas messages, they're the ones that are forwarded to me through the delivery system that appear then in my actual email inbox. I check them all the time. I've not been able to check my messages as of, um, like, let's see, yesterday, President's Day holiday, and I was kind of busy. So I'm going to get through my whole inbox today. If you've, if you've emailed me at all with any questions or anything else, um, I'll definitely follow up with you and reply to you by the end of today. So not to worry. I'm sticking to my 48-hour policy, so I'm trying to keep my policy straight. If you email me, you're going to get a reply no later than 48 hours. And I did clear the inbox as of Sunday night. So as long as I get to everything before the end of today, I'll be within that frame of time. Yeah, okay, but always check in on me if you need to message me through Canvas, through email, and we can also set up an appointment for Zoom if you ever want to have a face-to-face -face office hour type meeting. Okay, guys, so just clearing a few things. Feels like a Monday today, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Um, I had only a partial day off yesterday because most of the places where I teach didn't hold classes, but then one of them did. So it was just kind of like a weird half day off, but better than nothing at all. Um, yes, <laughs> funny. Okay, so um, cool. Today what we're going to then do is we're going to start talking about all the notes and information in Chapter 1 of the book. So we've covered a lot of stuff on Chapter 8, a little bit in Chapter 7. That's just having to do with deduction, induction, what is validity, what is soundness, what is inductive strength, and um, what are the different forms of deductively valid arguments. So that was what we kind of went over last time. Let me review that material with you guys really quickly since it's uh, important for the upcoming homework assignment. And so with your guys' help, I'm just going to ask a few basic questions about that topic of different forms of deductively valid argument. So anybody that's here, just let me know in the chat. What is one of the four different forms of deductively valid argument? that we uh, talked about. Let me know and then I'll expand on it from there with your help. So yeah. That sounds like a solid Monday. Noah, yeah, I was doing much the same myself. But back to my other question though. Um, one of the different forms. Okay, modus ponens, that's good. And Preston, when you say hypothetical syllogism, okay. To be precise, there are three of those hypothetical syllogisms. So hypothetical syllogism is like a family name, like my family name is Vulich, but there are different Vuliches. There's Richard Vulich, there's Danny Vulich, my brother David. So hypothetical syllogism is like a group. No, no, I'm just trying to expand, not, not to correct you in a way of being punitive, but just so you know, the hypothetical syllogism contains within it three members. There's modus ponens, modus tollens, and then the chain argument. Okay, good. So let me put those all up here and we'll go through each one. These are the hypothetical syllogism clan, if you will. So 
So first, one of them is called modus ponens. All right. Now with modus ponens, we've got two premises which lead to the conclusion that at the bottom. Um, first of all, how does this go overall? The, the format in terms of each premise leading to the conclusion. Just maybe you can write that in the chat. If it's um, confusing, you can number the premises with a number to the left of your statement. But let me know. The baby's flow or whatever, I mean, it's always the same. I guess he just changed it up a bit. But modus ponens, let me know, what's the form? <clears throat> what is it? <clears throat> I think you know it, but you know, you gotta tell me. I can't read your mind. So what is until you write it, I can't guess. Okay, Paul. If A, then B. Okay, second premise, A. So therefore B. That's very good. Okay, so this is what we have with modus ponens. The first premise is a hypothetical slash, you could call it conditional, either in. It says if A, then B. So in every single hypothetical, there are those two parts. You have the if part, which is called the, uh, if you remember, it's called the antecedent. The then component is known as the consequent. So with modus ponens, we state the hypothetical, the second premise affirms the antecedent, and then the conclusion is, the consequent. So many, many examples, infinite variety can be given. If I um, oversleep, then I will miss my first lecture. I overslept, so I missed my first lecture. Um, if I um, go for a run, then I'll be sore, and I did go for a run, so I'm sore. Just modus ponens. It's sometimes also called affirming the antecedent, and it's called that because of the order of steps starting with the conditional, affirming the antecedent part, namely A, and then concluding with uh, the consequent. Okay, so that's modus ponens. Let's move to the next of the three hypothetical syllogisms. I think somebody mentioned modus tollens. <clears throat> okay, so fill me in. Let me know the info I'm looking for. What is modus tollens? How does it go? So we've done a little bit of brief review. Paul, let me, I'm, the humor is very highbrow here, but let's see. A, B, C, D. D hypothetical, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit lost with your example. I want to catch the humorous reference, but you know, you kind of, it, what you've written would be a, an argument with a bunch of uh, uh, individual terms and no, Kind of conditionals or anything so you know there's no hypotheticals mentioned it but i'll have to be fully informed it's sometimes hard to catch you know humorous references to mere text but i'm trying prove to you if a then b not b and so therefore not a yes very good also correct trevor oh a hyper argumentative person okay i saw the word hypothetical and i'm like is this a spelling error or what am i to make of that but okay most tolens correct guys if A, then B, following after this, we say not B, and so therefore, in that case, not A. That's modus tollens. It sometimes is called denying the consequent, and that's because of, in the second premise, the consequent is been, uh, has been denied, which leads to the negation, the denial of the antecedent. So um, if I'm... Uh, let's see. If I was born in the United States, then I'm a United States citizen. I'm not a United States citizen, so therefore I'm not born in the United States. I mean, I am a U.S. citizen, but like in the in the structure of the argument, we could imagine that as one possible example. Um, if it rains, then the ground will be wet, and the ground is not wet, so therefore it didn't rain. I don't know. Just giving you a couple of quick examples. So that's modus tollens. Not to be confused with modus ponens. In modus ponens, the antecedent is affirmed, 
in modus tollens, the consequent is denied here. Okay. And then one more of the uh, three hypothetical syllogisms. Now we're talking about the chain argument. So someone I'm sure can quickly let me know what is the chain argument structure. Um, what's going on in this case? Go ahead. Anybody can just jump in. <laughs> The sugar rush at lunchtime. Okay, I see. See you there, Paul. Isn't it coffee, though, that you normally get in that morning? But I guess that'll also give you a, a sort of rush. Anyway, to the chain argument, just a few things. Let me know. Premise, premise, conclusion. <clears throat> if A, then B. If B, then C. And therefore, if A, then C. That's right, Mateo. And let me make sure. Noah, also good. Trevor, same. Well... Actually, Trevor, uh, well, okay, you're good. You're good because you added an additional premise, so no problem. Yeah, with the two-premise case that we have here, it would look like the following. If A, then B. If B, then C. So therefore, based on that, if A, then C. Okay, so um, if I... Um, Let's see. If I get a cut, then I will bleed, and if I bleed, then I will have a scab. So if I get a cut, then I'll have a scab. Or if I run, then I will sweat, and if I sweat, then I'll have to do laundry. So if I run, then I'll have to do laundry. If I um, water the plant, the plant will grow, and if the plant grows, it will bear fruit. So if I water the plant, then the plant will bear fruit. I mean. Just giving you different types of examples. Yeah, LaCroix, a lime flavor. Not one of my favorites, you know, but anyway, that's the chain argument. It goes in a chain uh, of events, kind of. You can think of it as a chain reaction. From one event, another follows. And from that event, subsequently, a further one does follow from it. And so, of course, then in case the first happens, we would ultimately have the third thing happen as well. And in chain argument, as I think um, Trevor has indicated, you can have more than two premises. If you had three premises, then we would just go in the same order, and wherever the last premise is stated, we would use its consequent as the consequent of the conclusion, and back to the first antecedent for the antecedent of the conclusion. Okay, so that's chain argument. We've covered and just done a quick review of the three hypothetical syllogisms. Just wanted to do that again because, again, like uh, your homework deals with those three cases specifically. But there's also the disjunctive syllogism. So someone tell me about this concept. What can you say about the, the so-called disjunctive syllogism form? Just give you a minute or however long, a couple seconds. Well, let me know. So this one does not have anything to do with the words if then. It's uh, it's not based on the hypothetical. So it's an either or sentence. That's what a disjunction is. Yeah, either A or B, not A. And so in that case, therefore B. Very good, everybody. Okay. Either A or B, not A. And so therefore B. Um, either. Um, <clears throat> either my car is parked um, in the garage or on the street, but the garage is closed for maintenance, so it's on the street. Um, either I will walk or drive to school. Maybe I should say it the other way because this makes the second premise more sensible. Either, either I'll drive or walk to school, but my car is not working, so I'm walking to school. Um, and good. Thanks, Amber. Thank you for letting me know. I'll make sure to keep your attendance clear. Yeah, so that's just the form of disjunctive syllogism, another of the disjunctively, uh, sorry, deductively valid forms of argument. Okay, so just now that we've covered all that stuff again and make sure to make it clear, we're going to start talking about the topics and the info in Chapter 1 of the book. Okay, so... 
Some of the first things that are discussed at the beginning of chapter one are these very famous social psychology experiments that um, were conducted back in the 60s and 70s, and they both, in different ways, highlight the value, the importance of being a good critical thinker. So let me kind of go over some of these famous studies with you. Maybe in other classes you've heard of some of these. I know that they're often a popular topic for like introductory psychology courses, sometimes even maybe sociology courses, but um, first let's go over the famous uh, so-called Milgram experiment. So we're, we're starting our chapter one notes with a little brief discussion and summary of two famous social psychology experiments. One of them is the Milgram experiment. Now this study was conducted by the researcher Stanley Milgram, so psychologist, professor, and researcher Stanley Milgram, hence the name Milgram experiment. Um, it was done at Yale University between the years 1960 and 1963, so early 1960s. Um, and let me give you a little bit of the historical context that sort of surrounds the experiment. Not long before this, I mean within a generation, I guess, before that, there was World War II and the, all of the horrors and the evils of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. And probably you guys know that at the conclusion of the war, um, the Allies placed uh, these Nazi officers on trial, the Nuremberg trials, and many and most of them were executed by hanging because of their participation in the, in the atrocities of the Holocaust. But many of these officers, some of the lower level officers and stuff, when they were being prosecuted in the Nuremberg trials, being held accountable you know, for what they did, many of them gave a common um, excuse that they were trying to use to justify their behavior. Maybe some of you are schooled enough in recent history to know this uh, overused line that was given by many of the Nazi officers in their own defense. They would say things like, do you know what I'm talking about? Like they would say, hey, don't, don't hold me accountable. If anything, look higher up the totem pole because what I was doing was just, uh, tell me what I'm referring to. Do you know this? The common excuse given? Yeah, so right, Preston, I was just following orders. I was just following orders. I'm just a, a small little gear in this much bigger machine and uh, the, the orders, they come down from above. Who am I to question those orders? I just acted and executed the orders, but I didn't create them, so don't blame me or don't hold me primarily responsible. But of course, that was not a valid legal or moral justification for what they did, and these people were still hanged and executed. So it's kind of like an instructive lesson that you need to think for yourself. Even if you believe you're getting some kind of presumably valid directive coming from a per perceived authority figure above you, it's still your obligation to consider rationally the content of what you're being asked to do. Because even in the military, one of the basic things that you're trained to do is never to obey an illegal order, even if you think it's coming from a superior officer. So you have to think then for yourself a little bit, like what am I being asked to do, and not just mindlessly follow along. But anyway, um, Milgram and others in the time period that he was living in, not even a generation removed from the World War II events, they wanted to study this, like how much of a tendency does an average everyday person have to obey commands even if the commands are evidently crossing the line into immorality, illegality, and just common sense, you know, harm to another human being. So that's what Milgram wanted to study. To, to what level are people going to obey commands? So here's how the study was conducted, all right? They put out an ad requesting volunteers to come and show up at the laboratory in Yale, and they would come in in pairs. When the two people that had come in to volunteer for the study came in, they said, well, okay, guys, here's the deal. We're going to basically do an experiment to see how punishment affects a person's ability to memorize and learn things. So they kind of told the subjects, this is all about seeing how well uh, giving a person punishment either helps or diminishes their capacity to learn material and to remember things. So that's what they said it was really about, but that's not actually what it was about. Um, to even further enhance the realism of this kind of little ruse that was being conducted. They said, we're going to put you guys into two roles. One is going to be teacher and one is going to be learner. And to make sure it's a random drawing, we're going to have you guys pull names out of a hat, or not names, but roles. One of the pieces of paper is going to say teacher and the other is going to say learner. And when you reach in the hat, you'll pull out and you'll see what your role is in the experiment. Now, this is kind of tricky. They actually rigged the drawing. 
both pieces of paper said teacher. Um, so that would make it so that both pulled a piece of paper out and said teacher. Now, the one subject that had not been previously coached, they see this and they think, okay, it was random that I became the teacher. 50-50 chance if I picked the other piece of paper, I would have been the learner. They didn't know that it was actually set up so that that person would definitively be the teacher. Now, the other person was coached that when they picked out the piece of paper, which also said teacher, that they would act like, okay, it says learner. That other individual was already debriefed and cooperating with the research team in advance, which the teacher did not know. So now we've got our learner and the teacher. They say, come over here, we're gonna put the learner behind this wall and we're gonna outfit him with electrodes. So there's little electroshock electrodes put on a person's body. And they say, okay, here's a set of word pairs. There's a set of word pairs in a list. We're gonna give you access to this list of pairs of words and we want you to try and memorize each pair. And um, they're just random pairs of words, like no relevance to the two words. It could be like dog, car, um, boy, neck, you know, like sky, book, just random pairs of words. And um, they said, take a look at the list and examine it, try to memorize it for some number of minutes, five minutes. Then we're gonna take the list away from you and um, we're gonna put the teacher on the other side of this wall. And what he's gonna do is he's going to ask you to try and remember the pairing of words by saying the first word in the pair and then giving you a multiple choice set of options as to what the second one could have been. So for example, suppose the actual correct pair was boy neck. The teacher, quote unquote, would then say to the person, okay guys, here we go. The first word is boy. Now, what is the second word? Is it neck, dog, spoon, or farm? You know, just random stuff. Now they're supposed to remember that it was actually neck. Okay, so if they get that right answer and they pair it correctly with their memory, then that's fine. But if they got the wrong response, they chose one of the other um, alternative options, then what the teacher was supposed to do was push a switch that would deliver a shock to the individual that's in the position of learner. And it was supposed to be a voltage of some intensity that caused some pain. With each additional wrong answer, they told the teacher, you have to go up the voltage scale to deliver a more intense shock. So they had this whole electroshock generator with switches on it, and they were clearly marked off with voltage levels. As you go further and further along the spectrum, it's saying stuff like danger, extremely dangerous shock, blah, 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 up to 450 volts. Now here's the thing. There actually were no real shocks being given at all. So that was all just a trick that was being played on the teacher. The teacher, of course, thought these were real shocks. And to even further convince him of that, you know, the learner who had been coached before had been told to deliberately give a lot of wrong answers to sort of compel this person to deliver more and more shocks. And as they went in intensity becoming more severe, the learner had been coached to start screaming out in greater and greater agony and, and starting to demand to be released from the experiment, saying things like this. Um, I can't handle this, the pain is too much, I refuse to answer any more questions, you know, I didn't know what I was getting into. In the beginning, they say to the person, I have a heart condition and I, I used to be a veteran, the, at the veterans hospital they said that I have to be careful about my heart. All the while, protesting, demanding to be let free, screaming out of pain and agony, the teacher's on the other side wondering what to do and the researcher is just telling them, no, you gotta keep going. The experiment requires that you keep going. Ignore what they're saying. They don't know about electric shocks. They'll be okay. Just keep, keep going and keep giving them questions. So if there were no real shocks that were actually being delivered, then what was the point of the study? What, was, what were we trying to determine by means of conducting this experiment? Clearly it wasn't to see how well or whatever punishment helps you learn because there was no actual punishment. So what was the point again? Let's see if you can just kind of Give me your insight into what the real point of the study is. If the teacher would follow bad orders, right? So how generally obedient are everyday people to perceived authority figures when they, even when the authority figures are clearly asking you to cross moral and ethical guidelines. So before the study was conducted, they, they surveyed, you know, um, a body of professional psychologists and they asked these guys, well, what do you think um, percentage of test subjects will give all the shocks versus how many do you think will refuse to keep going? And um, psychologists that were surveyed on the question, they were very optimistic. They thought, well, human nature and just your conscience is going to kick in for people. So I they said it's not even going to be 10% of people that are going to give all these shocks. And so from that standpoint, the, the experiment was actually quite revealing and a little bit disturbing 
because um, fully two thirds of people gave all the shocks all the way to 450 volts. But there was a healthy minority contingent of about 35 or so percent that did refuse to continue after some number of, of initial shocks. And um, I'm going to actually share it to you guys. So I'll send a Canvas announcement. And I, I want you to look at some of the archived video. Um, it's fascinating to watch in real life face-to-face -face classes. I would always put it on uh, at one of the meetings so that you could kind of see the footage. Um, I think it's one thing to hear me talk about it or to even read it on the page, but it really hits differently when you actually watch the old footage. And it's quite um, revealing. The people that were able to stop and refuse to obey were the kind of people that started to give rational arguments and counter arguments for the insistence on continuing. So they were able to marshal reasons. They were able to say such things as, although he's here voluntarily, you know, he doesn't know enough about electricity, nor do I to continue in good conscience. And so it's against the person's will. I don't think that this is appropriate. Making rational arguments like that gave people the confidence and the backbone to basically refuse the authority's commands. The people, the, the majority contingent of about two thirds that went all the way, in many cases, they showed telltale signs of anxiety, discomfort, um, hesitation, but they were still mindlessly obeying uh, despite these signs of nervous um, anticipation of having to give more shocks or being requested to give more shocks. So it teaches us a little bit of a lesson. Being a good critical thinker gives you the kind of intellectual tools that you need to resist authority if and when it's appropriate. Not to say on the opposite extreme that authority is never valid and it's just better to always rebel against it or something, no. But you have to still consider the content of what you're being asked to do. If in this study, a person could be compelled to deliver painful, violent shocks to another human being that they thought was a military veteran with a heart condition against their will, just because uh, there was a person in a lab coat that you know, appears professional as a researcher telling them to do it, just imagine how much more so people can lapse in their moral or ethical or professional judgment when there's real authoritative commands coming from an actual source that has that kind of um, title or, or claim. So anyway, that's one of these studies, Milgram's experiment. It's the one with the false electric shocks, and it opens our chapter once. So that's why I kind of wanted to read about it. I'm not sure... Kayla and Noah, is this a humorous reference to the concept of anarchy? I mean, anarchy would be have its own problems. You need to have some kind of guiding principles to ha have a coherent and well-formed society, but it does take um, critical thinkers for that kind of society to exist. Let me go into the book for a moment. Um, it says here, Nazi war criminal Adolf Eichmann was tried in Israel in 1960 for crimes against humanity. Despite his claim that he was just following the orders of his superiors when he ordered the deaths of millions of Jews, the court found him guilty and executed him, sentencing him to death. Was he a monster, or was he just doing what many others would do following orders from superiors? To address the question, social psychologist Stanley Milgram of Yale University conducted between 1960 and 63 what has become a classic experiment. An advertisement in the newspaper asking for men to take part in the scientific study of memory and learning. Those chosen to participate were told that the purpose of the study was to study the effect of punishment on learning, and their job was to give electric shocks as punishment when a learner gave a wrong answer. Participants were told the shocks would be given at the direction of the researcher, and they would range in intensity from 15 to 450 volts. In fact, no shocks were actually given, but the participant didn't know that. As the intensity of the shocks increased, the learner, who was actually in on the whole study and acting, responded with anguish, screaming in pain, pleading with the participant, delivering shocks to stop. Despite the pleas, all participants did give shocks of up to 300 volts before refusing. Yeah. And in addition, 65% continued to deliver shocks all the way to the full 450 volt range. Most who continued were clearly disturbed by what they were doing. However, unlike the participants that refused, they were not able to give logical counter arguments to the scientists' demands. And so that's one of our famous studies to know about. Um, and good reference, Kayla. Yeah, there's, um, there is a movie that was made not too long ago. Um, oh, no, no, no. You know what? I may be wrong about the reference. I'm thinking of the other experiment that we're now just about to talk about. Um, if there is a Milgram movie, I would love to know that. But maybe you're thinking of the Stanford prison experiment. Is that maybe the case? We'll come back to that. You can go ahead and search it on Google or whatever. But that's the next experiment. So... Milgram experiment, just some details and commentary for you guys. Now I have to talk about the other one that's also mentioned at the top of chapter one. 
And this is the Zimbardo experiment. The Zimbardo experiment, so let me ask, does anyone have any background knowledge on this as of yet? Or is it all new to you, the Zimbardo? If you know anything about it, just you can even just type in the vague outline of what you may know. If you don't know anything about it, that's fine. You can tell me. Never heard of it. Just checking in with you, because I've found that Zimbardo is a little bit more well-known to maybe everyday people than the Milgram, even though often they do mention Milgram in psychology classes at college. But even the pop culture seems to have caught on to some of the facts concerning the Zimbardo study. Anybody? Let me know. Not familiar, Matteo? No problem. I'll definitely let you know right now. Okay, well, as I see the comments still coming in, I'll just let you know about it. So Zimbardo experiment. This was done under the supervision of this psychologist and researcher whose name is Philip Zimbardo. And, um, <clears throat> okay, yeah, it is about the prison simulation. That's right, Paul. How people behave in a prison environment. Also, that's on point, Trevor, yes. So a little bit of background knowledge. And let me just add detail now. So it was done by Philip Zimbardo, and this was at um, Stanford University over here in California, um, 1971. It's sometimes now referred to just colloquially as the Stanford Prison Experiment. So I mean, that's AKA Stanford Prison Experiment for reasons that I will now make clear. Um, it was actually given funding by the U.S. Navy, um, and I guess the U.S. Navy, Zimbardo, and Stanford were interested in questioning this um, this topic, like how will people, everyday people, respond when they are put into a, a social situation where some people have much more control over the others? Um, how will people respond to the social pressures that kind of exemplify the, the dynamic of a prison system, basically? So they wanted to run a simulated prison to see how just volunteers from the community would behave in their roles as either guard or prisoner of a mock prison. So they sent out um, ads recruiting subjects and they said, you guys are going to participate in a two week prison simulation in the basement of the psychology department at Stanford University. Um, they really went to lengths to create a sense of realism around this simulated prison experiment because the people that had signed on to play the role of um, guard, uh, prisoners were actually apprehended at their house by the Palo Alto police who kind of cooperated with the university in bringing a further sense of reality to the to the simulation. So they, you know, they arrested them and then they brought them to the prison, which is this basement of Stanford psychology department. Other student volunteers, so these are like college age male student volunteers that were recruited for the study, uh, were put in the role of prison guard. So basically Zimbardo got them and he said, you guys, we're gonna divide into two camps. There's gonna be some that are prisoners and some that are prison guards. And the only guideline is you can't cause like obvious permanent physical harm or damage to your prisoners. But other than that, do whatever you feel uh, is necessary to, to enforce compliance, obedience, and order in this mock prison. Right, so they gave him very loose oversight. They said, "Do whatever necessary, apart from the most extreme things you can imagine, uh, to run the prison. You're just the prison guards, and you're going to run the prison." So, maybe that does remind you of the, the classic scene you're thinking of there with uh, Bruce Willis and those guys. But, but, but I digress. Okay, so run the prison however you like. It was supposed to go for two weeks, but let me tell you, it actually had to be canceled after just six days. It had to be canceled prematurely, and that was because it was quickly spinning out of control. Um, what happened was, after just a couple of days, the prison guards started to become increasingly abusive, sadistic, and cruel to their um, the people in the role of simulated prisoners. They were forcing them to do things like um, clean toilets with their bare hands and eat food off of the floor, trying to sexually humiliate them, making them do like mock wedding um, ceremonies with other subjects to kind of induce play on homophobic fears and anxieties and um, one prisoner had to be sent home because he was having a nervous and mental breakdown and others were starting to report similar kind of trauma. So a graduate student of, of Philip Zimbardo approached him after the sixth day and said, you know, professor, I think that we're going too far with this and you have to shut it down. 
And uh, he realized that he himself was allowing it to go too far as well. So it was another instructive lesson on how people will sometimes devolve into irrational and immoral behavior if they don't have some kind of principles or intellectual uh, principles to guide them through their conduct. So being a good critical thinker, again, makes you stop for a minute and ask questions like, what am I doing and why am I doing it? Instead of just um, giving into the base instincts of, of human nature that we sometimes do have. You know, so we don't want to be like conducting ourselves with oversight authority and just becoming punitive, abusive, and cruel in the roles that we may find ourselves occupying. And if, if people can act this way within the confines of a simulation where everybody should know that these are not real prisoners and they don't actually deserve any harsh treatment so much more than everyday citizens who may find themselves caught up in the prison system and who still deserve humane treatment under the law, um, how much more so is there a potential for real abuse when there's actual power given to people in, in positions of authority? And you mentioned Abu Ghraib. That's a good reference there, Paul. Um, that specifically is talked about in a video that I'm going to link you guys to, which has commentary from Zimbardo after Abu Ghraib, talking about the connections that he saw himself between the results of his research and then actual abuses that we've witnessed in either the prison system or in um, detainee camps that we've set up around the world in theaters of war and so on. So that's what it says in the book as well. I'll just finish reading it, and then we can move to some more stuff from Chapter 1. It says, along similar lines, in 1971... The U.S. Navy funded a study of the reaction of humans to situations in which there are huge differences in authority and power, as in prison. The study was administered under the direction of psychologist Philip Zimbardo, who's still alive, by the way, and he still has interesting thoughts and commentary on the current political situation and everything else. But anyway, Philip Zimbardo selected student volunteers judged to be psychologically stable and healthy. The volunteers were randomly assigned to play the role of either guard or prisoner in a two-week prison simulation in the basement of the Stanford University building where the psychology department was located. To make the situation more realistic, guards were given wooden batons and wore khaki military-style uniforms and mirrored sunglasses that minimized eye contact. Yeah, so um, that was another thing. Bringing them into their roles a little bit more was facilitated and enhanced by the um, outward appearance established through these uniforms. So the prisoner guards were made to look kind of professional and they had these mirrored sunglasses that you couldn't see through. Um, and then the prisoners themselves were given these awkward, ill-fitting smocks, um, rubber thongs for their feet, smocks without underwear, um, a little um, chain around their ankle and they were they would refer to them by a number instead of their actual name to, to further dehumanize or to blur out the, their, their identity and make them more of like just kind of an anonymous prison subject. The guards were not given any formal instructions. They were simply told it was their responsibility to run the prison. And then the dynamics of human nature and power and control kind of took over. The experiment quickly got out of control. Prisoners were subjected to abusive, humiliating treatment, physical and emotional by the guards. One third of the guards became increasingly cruel, especially at night when they thought cameras were turned off. Prisoners were forced to clean toilets and sleep on concrete floors, endure solitary confinement in like a broom closet. That was their like solitary confinement chamber. They were forced and subjected to nudity, sexual abuse, much like what would happen in actual prison scandals later on. For example, Abu Ghraib, and that's mentioned in the book. And more recently, some cases of detainee treatment in Guantanamo Bay. After just six days, the Stanford prison experiment had to be called off. And so I guess one more thing below. They suggest that many, if not most, will uncritically follow the commands of those in authority. Like the Milgram study, the Stanford Prison Experiment demonstrated that ordinary people will commit atrocities in situations where there is social or institutional support for the behavior uh, that they would not do on their own and if they could put the blame on others. So, you know, you would never in your ordinary life treat people like that. It's only when you feel that you have the kind of institutional support and backing of authority that you start to conduct yourself in that type of way. So we want to be good critical thinkers, and that also equips us to be more well-rounded uh, moral reasoners and citizens. So we learn a little bit of a dark lesson from some of these studies. And another thing that I think is interesting about the studies, why are they always referred to, and it's 2021, 50 years later, aren't there any new studies that shed light on the same topics? Well, the thing is, no. These studies are considered classics because um, what we learned on the basis of doing them is, in part, that they were traumatic to the people involved. And so they would never pass ethics boards and um, ethics guidelines in an in a actual research setting today. So that's why we will never be able to replicate studies with similar findings. 
the, the people put in these positions reported lasting post-traumatic stress. I mean, even if you know it's a simulation, if you've got someone coming down on you, sexually humiliating and verbally abusing you, you'll live with those memories. And even in the parole of prison guard, some of them said, I didn't know it, I could be so cruel and sadistic because these are just average college students. It's not like they went finding people from the psych ward. That's part of the lesson that was learned, that it doesn't take like a, a psychopathic monster to devolve into this type of behavior, that it's something that lurks beneath the surface of most human beings as long as we don't um, develop the intellectual tools needed to act better than that and to resist those, those drives. Paul, you say, I wonder if it's just having authority to use as an excuse. I suspect that lack of authority or consequence also explains bad behavior, like a mob mentality, looting, et cetera. Yes, we'll talk about that too. We're gonna to talk about the diffusion of responsibility later on in this class, and that is when a person um, in a group setting doesn't feel individually responsible for what's happening at, on the part of the group. You know, so like um, in some cases we see that when there's like an emergency and somebody needs to take action, but everyone's waiting for somebody else to do it. So sometimes group thing can lead to inaction. Sometimes group thing can lead to action that's bad and it's somehow thought more justifiable because you're only one small part of the larger group. Yes, and another literary reference to similar uh, lessons comes from Lord of the Flies. But this is a real scientific research study. These two things do show us a lot of the the greater human value and importance uh, to being a good critical thinker. Okay, so good critical thinking helps you intellectually resist authority when and if it's appropriate. In our lives, we sometimes are too deferential to others, especially those that we think hold power or authority over us and we neglect to think on our own. So a good critical thinker always tries to think for themselves and only acts on the basis of principles that they endorse, not to simply do things because they were told to do them, especially when they find them morally or legally questionable. Okay, so a couple of interesting points on those social psychology experiments. After that, uh, the text next describes the stages in the process of your cognitive development over your life. Let me see, I'm looking at your comments. I've kind of not paid attention to each one. Group thing, confirmation bias, yes, these are scary things. So the next thing is all about cognitive development. Cognitive development, first of all, the overall concept is it's a lifelong process of acquiring intelligence and problem-solving ability. So I'll put that here. Okay, so cognition refers to um, the mind or the brain, consciousness. Um, like if a person who's um, cognitively impaired, right, it might be like uh, they're under the influence of certain drugs or they're going through a psychotic episode or something. And so the word cognitive always has to do with like aspects of the brain and consciousness. So cognitive is your lifetime, meaning becoming more intelligent, gaining the ability to further um, successfully solve problems and complete tasks. Little babies, as you guys know, that are just out of the womb. They don't even have the ability to talk or judge any kind of questions yet. And we think of sometimes people, um, if they've been able to have a healthy, long life, and avoided cognitive impairment or disease or disability, then you, you become this wise person that's acquired all kinds of knowledge and experience throughout your lifetime. And most of us are just somewhere on the spectrum, right, in between. Well, it's a lifelong process because there's always something new that you can learn. It doesn't just end with your formal education. I mean, I guess I took my... Um, education to the absolute limit with the PhD, but I still think that I'm learning new things almost every day, every week, um, from people, from my society, um, from the things even that I have to teach and report on. So it's an open-ended process that's only really limited by the possibilities of disease, debility, cognitive decline. Um, and there are stages of cognitive development. It's mentioned in the textbook that there have been researchers who've studied the phases of it, and uh, one of the is named, named William Perry Jr., education researcher. He believed that there were three, well, he divided them even further than three, but our textbook simplifies a bit and says there's overall three general stages of cognitive development if you go through all these steps. So let me try and talk about that with you guys next. The three steps or stages of cognitive development according to 
psychologist and researcher William Perry Jr. So we're just talking about um, a quick here this man's research. <laughs> William Perry Jr., who lived from 1913 to 1998. And, I mean, not too important to know his life and dates, but just know he's like a 20th century, more recent, modern um, psychologist. And he thought there were the three stages of cognitive development. Okay, and I see here the lifelong process of acquiring intelligence and problem-solving ability. Sorry, Kayla, I just see your comment now. Um, once in a while, if you have a blurry connection because of bandwidth issues, then it can affect the quality of the screen. Let me know if you have any other issues with this, then I will certainly be happy to type it. Okay, the three stooges, no. Larry, Curley, and Mo. There's no sequence. They're all, they're all there at the same time. So anyway, the three stages of cognitive development. You have dualism, relativism, and commitment. So first, let's talk about dualism. Dualism, as a term which refers to a stage of cognitive development, is described as your earliest and most basic initial stage of um, intellectual development in life. So you got to think of the mental outlook and perspective of young children. Um, it's basically thinking that truth is all black and white. There's no ambiguity, there's no gray area. Everything is just fully understood and known. But by who? By smart authority figures that will just deliver the facts to me. And I just take in that information, don't question it, don't challenge it. I'm like a receptacle into which information from above me flows and I have no power to challenge or deny those claims. So truth is all black and white. meaning clear, unambiguous, every question has already been settled, truth is all black and white, and authority figures have the answers to all questions. Okay, so thinking of the uh, mental habits and perspectives of you know small young children you really can't be blamed for having a dualistic point of view at that stage of life because you're not yet experienced enough in the world you, you know you don't have like a seven-year-old and the parent says to them here's something true like the world is round and like but how do you know mom or dad like give me a better argument I need to be proven or convinced usually you just take it out as a given you know when you hear things from your teachers your parents other respected authority figures that deliver you information, media members, whatever, children will just accept it and take it at face value, not question it, not reflect on it, not debate or discuss it, just that's a given, that's what I was told, okay? And so at this stage of life, you really defer all the intellectual labor to others, kind of intellectual labor to them. Smart people above me, older than me, wiser than me, they figured out things, I'll just find out what they believe or what they know, and I don't have to think for myself very much. So it's not really a very active, intellectual perspective to inhabit. You just think of yourself as the passive recipient of knowledge from on high. Okay, and that's what it says here in the book. Younger people um, tend to take in knowledge and life experiences in a simple dualistic way, viewing something as either right or wrong. They see knowledge as existing outside themselves and look to authority figures for all the answers. Um, so at that stage of life, it's like very hard for a person to deal with the concept of ambiguity or when experts don't agree with each other. You know, if you think that people above me know everything, then what if, like, one expert says um, a glass of wine every night is really not so bad for you, it could even be good for your cardiovascular health. Another expert says, no, I have a different research finding, that this is totally false and it's just healthier for you overall not to drink alcohol at all. Now you've got two different experts disagreeing, and if you're in the dualist phase, your mind is blown. You're like, well, hold on. I thought there was only just one answer to everything, and so-called authority figures know it. So... Eventually, you start to see the limitations of this perspective, and if you grow a little bit and mature a little bit, you start to reach the second stage, and that would be relativism. <clears throat> okay. Um, 
Yeah. So, oh, you mentioned Santa Claus. That's a good reference, Ian. You're thinking like when a parent tells a kid, hey, there's a Santa, they don't usually stop and say, but how does he fly up there? I mean, what's the mechanism by which the, the sleigh stays airborne? I mean, how is that consistent with the laws of aerodynamics and, uh, and gravity and so on? I mean, so yeah, they'll just accept things, even if they're far-fetched and fanciful. That's true. Now, relativism is a second stage, though. Suppose you moved on from just thinking that everything's already known and the truth is all set out completely by authorities. Well, at the relativist stage, it's like a whole backlash against that. It's almost going to the opposite extreme and overdoing it. Now the person thinks that truth is all just personal opinion. And so there's really no such thing as objective facts and truth. There's just opinions. And since everyone has their own opinion, we should treat them all as equal and not criticize anyone's opinion. I'm sorry, Austin. Just, just kidding. I meant Satan, uh, not Santa. But anyway, relativism. Um, truth is all just a matter of opinion. Okay. Um, yeah, this is number two. So you're actually good there, um, Noah, not to worry. Um, relativism, the second stage of cognitive development. And here's what it does say. It's just when a person starts thinking that, no, truth is not just black and white and objective. It's all personal opinion. And since opinions are just subjective to the individual, we should treat them all as equal and no one should be judged for their opinion. Um, well, here's the thing, though. Um, yes, people have different opinions, but not all opinions are equally valid. You know, not all opinions are equally justified by the available evidence. So it's good in a way to realize that even experts can get things wrong and that they can disagree among themselves, that there's still some work for us to do to discover our own opinion, even after we've heard from other people. That's all to the good. But we don't want to take it so far on the opposite extreme that we literally think there's no such thing as objective truth to even strive for, right? So um, there's a saying I feel like uh, is a good saying. I learned it from one of my advisors in grad school, and he said, it's good to have an open mind, but you don't want to have such an open mind that your brain just falls out of your head. Now, that's a metaphor, right? But it means have an open mind, realize that there's diversity of opinion, but at the same time, um, don't just say anything goes, and there's really – a crazy conspiracy theorist's opinion is just as much valid as, you know, careful and um, patient research conducted by a thorough investigation. So in the end, um, you start to see the limitations of relativism. And if you move on to the third and highest stage of intellectual development, then you'll get the best of both worlds. And that is the phase that is called uh, commitment. Okay. And just, quickly here in the book, I'm going to read a little bit about the relativism part. It says, <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So just because people have different opinions doesn't mean that we have to grant equal validity or credibility to, to poorly sourced, poorly researched, unjustified claims in comparison with those that are um, done with patience, integrity, and according to academic standards of, of uh, research. It says on relativism, rather than accepting that ambiguity and uncertainty may be unavoidable and that they need to make decisions despite this, students at the relativist stage go to the opposite extreme. They reject the dualistic worldview and instead believe that all truth is relative or just a matter of opinion. People at this stage believe that stating your opinion is the best way to express yourself and may even look down on challenging people's opinions as judgmental, quote unquote. The belief that all truth is relative can lead to mental paralysis though. Uh, because what are you supposed to believe if everything's just relative and there's no objective facts? It would almost eliminate the purpose and point of forming opinions at all, you know? So you have to continue to develop if you can. I find that the relativist stage of um, intellectual development is a pretty common stage for, for young adults, um, adolescents, teenagers, and so on. But through your education, through your studies, through your college years and work and just relationships that you form with people – you might reach to the third and final stage commitment. So what this is all about 
is now you commit to your own views based upon reason and the best available evidence. Okay. Okay, commitment. One commits to their own views based on what? Based on reason, you know, their logical reasoning ability and the evidence that's available, the highest, best quality evidence that's available. So this, I believe, kind of merges together the best aspects of the two previous phases of cognitive development. Let me explain why. First of all, um, unlike the relativist, the commitment phase of intellectual development does hold that there is objective truth. You commit to your views, but you do so with the belief that you're getting to the actual truth of the matter. So you have this hope and this idea, this belief that you can really get to the actual factual truth. That's when you commit to those views because you think they're correct. But unlike the dualist, you don't just defer to a higher court of authority on the development of these views. You yourself think that you're a competent enough judge to weigh the evidence and come up with your own perspective on things. After all, sometimes you have to become that expert upon whom others defer and, uh, and, and rely on. And how would you ever become that expert if you're always looking to someone else to sort of dictate to you what the correct uh, conclusions ought to be? So at the commitment stage, you have the independence of mind to come up with your own point of view. But when you get to those conclusions, you also don't just think, well, that's my own relative opinion and it has no greater force than anybody else's. You believe that you're coming to actual true conclusions using reason and good evidence. But the conclusions that you reach, you don't just think are relatively true, but actually true, and that requires you to commit to them. Now let me go up here a little bit and see some comments. I know I've been lecturing, and I want to make sure I don't miss any of those. Flat Earth QAnon, yes, mentioned that. I like how people use DSLR to show that there's no curvature. Okay, yeah, that's not good at all. Um, anthropogenic global warming, yes, people deny that, even though there's almost more evidence for that than any other scientific hypothesis, apart from evolution maybe. Uh, no, I don't know, bro. If you go to these Flat Earth conventions and you learn that they are mostly just anti-Semitic, okay, yes, there's a lot more there. <laughs> there's a lot in the whole conspiracy theory social circles, you know, uh, that bubbles up from dark corners of human nature. Uh, so, yes. Let's see, going on further, you guys talking about the horoscopes, blah, blah, blah. We'll get to those later. Oh, happy birthday, Kayla. Is that a Pisces? Fellow Pisces in the house? Same here, but not like I believe in the horoscopes. Just, it's funny. Okay. Cool. So we're back. Done with the stages of cognitive development then. Let me read one more point from the book. Here's what it says. <clears throat> As students mature, they come to realize that not all thinking is equally valid. Not only can authorities be mistaken, but also in some circumstances, uncertainty and ambiguity are unavoidable. When students at this stage experience uncertainty, they're now able to make decisions and commit to particular positions on the basis of reason and the best available evidence. At the same time, as independent thinkers, they're open to challenges able to remain flexible and willing to change their views if new evidence comes to light. As we mature and acquire better critical thinking skills, our way of conceptualizing and understanding the world becomes increasingly complex. This is particularly true of older students who return to college after spending time out in the real world. Unlike people at the first stage who look to authority for answers, people at the third stage accept responsibility for their interactions with their environment and are more open to challenges, more accepting of ambiguity. Okay. Yes. Da-da-da-da-da. Well, Paul, I, you know, th there's only so far we can go with all the humor, but anyway, ha ha. So let's go on. <clears throat> okay, now, <clears throat> next up, we're going to talk about what are some of the different qualities of a good critical thinker, and that's important to know. So the textbook kind of refers to what are some of the attributes, characteristic traits that you would usually see in a person who fits this description of a good critical thinker? Like what's the overall profile of a good critical thinker? Because we're trying to emulate that, that, that type of person, but make progress towards that standard. So knowing what qualities typify critical thinkers will give us a sort of roadmap to try and chart a course towards that goal. Okay, <clears throat> so qualities of a good critical thinker.
Okay, so it starts off with some that are very broad in their description. In my mind, some of the ones that are further down the list are of greater interest, but we've got to start at the top. So first of all, there are analytical skills. Analytical skills. So that's simply the ability to provide logical support for your beliefs and opinions instead of having unfounded, literally baseless opinions. All right? <clears throat> the ability to provide logical support for your views instead of having baseless opinions. Okay, so a good critical thinker is able to essentially back themselves up with reasons, with, with justification. Um, if you're called on to explain why you think something's true or why you, how you know that or whatever, you have something that you're ready to say. You can tell the person, well, I mean, here are the reasons that I use to come to my conclusions. Then the other person, whether they agree with you or not, can understand where you're coming from and see that it's based on something. If someone asks you, why do you believe in global warming, you're like, uh, I don't know, I have no idea, it's just something I think, then even if you're correct, you kind of don't have credibility with the way you're talking because you haven't been able to support the, re the, the reasons behind your belief. So good critical thinkers are never at a loss or they don't lack for reasons. They can defend their views with logical evidence and argument. Um, so that's a fundamental quality of good critical thinkers. They're not flat-footed or uh, in search of some kind of basis for their beliefs. They're not on the spot when people ask them, why is that true, or how do you know? Because the whole reason they believe it is because of those reasons. Okay, and then another quality of a good critical thinker is effective communication. Okay, so with effective communication, I mean, it's one of the interesting hallmark features of just a human being that we have language, that we can convey ideas, content, beliefs between each other through speech, through writing, in some cases through sign language and through other symbols. Other animals can't do that. I mean, you know, lower animals, they don't have any idea of what was happening in the world 100 years ago or what's maybe going to be happening even in a couple of weeks. Um, they don't know what position the planet is in relationship to the sun or, you know, uh, what's going on with the periodic table of elements. So the only reason we have all this additional knowledge is because we can capture the facts in a language that we can then disseminate these facts through time. You know, we pass on the knowledge of the past to the next generation through writings, etc. Well, one part of being a good critical thinker is being good at effective communication, the exchange of information from one to another. And there's just a couple of basic elements of this. So it has to do with speaking and writing, of course, but also listening to other people carefully and being aware of different communication styles. So Okay, so with language and um, communication, sometimes we do so by means of the spoken word, like what I'm doing right now, talking to you. And sometimes you're the one who's the speaker, and sometimes you're the one being spoken to in a communicative exchange. Well, when you're the speaker, you want to be able to speak well, have command of your thoughts, have command of the diction and vocabulary of the English language, know how to concisely state your point with a minimum of unnecessary information to seem professional, polished, and uh, composed when you when you communicate verbally. Speaking is one part, of course, writing is the other. Um, sometimes we communicate in the written form, as you see here on this board, or as you read in email exchanges, direct messages, texts. Um, sometimes you're applying for jobs. Sometimes you are um, submitting work for school. When you're doing those things, it's always to your advantage to be a little bit clearer, expressive, 
um, professional in the way that you communicate. Nobody in the world has ever said, you know, I wish I wasn't so good at speaking or writing. Those are skills that are useful to you in everyday life and they're marketable skills too. So to the extent that we can make any progress in school um, and in our own lives at the art of writing and speaking, we're going to be better off. Finally, there's also listening, you know, because it's a two-way street in, in communication. Um, sometimes you're the one being spoken to. And in that case, it's on you to try and listen to the other party, understand what they're saying so that you can form a coherent and a thoughtful response. Don't just sit there ignoring what they're saying, blocking them out, waiting for your chance to talk, and then just say, hey, cool story or something generic at the end. You want to listen to people because it's only when you care about what they're saying that others are going to care about what you're saying as well. So try to do your part. Meet the person halfway. Pay attention to what they say so that you can point out any errors, inconsistencies, and also clarify whatever the issue is at hand. Um, the last thing is about having awareness of different styles of communication. So the way we communicate in one setting is not always a, appropriate in another type of setting. Um, when I have classes to teach in this kind of academic setting, I mean, I try to keep it kind of real in the way that I am as a human person, but um, it's a lot more pedantic and um, academic and formal than I would talk with my friends or whatever in an everyday setting. So one part is just knowing how to be chameleon-like and adapt to the purposes of the current communication that you're engaged with. The way you would talk to a professor in an email or to an employer at a job interview or to an officer or something um, on the street might be a lot different than how you would communicate with friends, relatives, uh, people with whom you have some kind of working relationship but maybe not so formal. Um, also, when it comes to styles of communication, there's the whole code switching thing that I'm talking about there. But then there's also just knowing how people have a tendency to communicate. Some people are more passive and uh, shy. Some people are a little more outgoing and expressive. Some people are even passive aggressive somewhere in the middle. So knowing how other people with whom you're interacting have a tendency to communicate can sometimes help you to adapt to the circumstances at hand. Like if you come in very aggressively with a very passive communicator, communication could break down a little bit. So sometimes you have to um, move off of one of your modes of communication that you're more comfortable with to facilitate the best and most productive exchange with another person. So just some elements of effective communication while we have that in the book. I'm looking here above a little bit. Um, global warming, climate change, interchangeable terms. Okay, still talking about the whole climate change sidebar. Um, yeah, Minnesota nice, passive aggressive. Oh, okay, you've got some experience with the Minnesotans. Uh, I've not been there. Well, I have some friends from there, um, but I've never touched down in the state myself, so I couldn't speak to that, but you know, cultural tropes and stereotypes, there's sometimes is a little truth, but for the most part, you got to deal with people on a case by case basis. So we've got now two things, analytical skills and effective communication. Okay. Well, you grew up there. I'm giving you full license then to say whatever you want, Paul. <laughs> um, next we go into research and ink skills. Okay. <clears throat> Let's just say research skills here. In a way, it's self-explanatory. I feel the book could have chosen a better label that doesn't come so close to a circular definition. But anyway, what we have is this is competence and ability to evaluate, uh, compile, um, and gather evidence for the purposes of research. So, Competence at gathering, evaluating, and putting together evidence for the purposes of research. So here's the deal when it comes to research. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the world that's interesting to know about, like knowledge that you don't have right now. And that's true of all of us. I mean, there's so many things that I would love to know about that I've not yet taken a course of study on or I have not yet sought to inform myself about, right? Like what is uh, the history of like um, 
like Uzbekistan or just a random country. Like, I don't know that. I don't know, you know, any of the dates, key figures, um, major events. I, I'm informed on a lot of things, but in some things I'm not fully informed. And the same is true of you, right? There's only so much time in a person's life. But if you find an interest in something that you don't know about, how are you going to learn about it? Well, you're not going to be able to just make stuff up in your head or dream about it. You're going to have to seek the information from some reliable sources outside of you. In other words, do research. So if I want to know about the history of Uzbekistan, then I'm going to have to go out and find some good sources of information to research that topic. So to inform yourself, you got to do research, but that means that you got to find the information in the first place, and you have to be able to evaluate it, knowing what is a reliable or an unreliable source of information, how being able to distinguish fact from fiction, credible from non-credible claims. And then finally, if you're actually going to piece this information together for an actual research project, sometimes you might do that in school. Sometimes you might just do that for your own interest. Sometimes you may be doing that for work-related projects or et cetera. Well, in the end, you have to put all the information together in a coherent way so it can explain um, the facts and information that you've learned about the research topic. So that's a good and marketable skill. It takes you far in school, but of course, we sometimes want to research things on our own just to know about them for our own knowledge. So that's another of the good qualities that we've talked about here. Okay, now after this, I think some of the next items that are mentioned in the book have a lot more philosophical interest to me, so I'll enjoy presenting some of these. And let me look below. When you're stuck in a one-room cabin in a blizzard, you either murder everyone or go along to get along. Okay, yeah, well, you know, you're saying it, not me. I mean, but I'm sure Minnesota is a lovely place. Have you ever been ice fishing? Well, maybe you'll let me know. Anyway. And you've lived in Iowa, Ian. Nice. I've, I've visited there a few times, but just passing through um, on some, like, cross-country trips. Okay, yeah. You, can you even ca catch a big fish? If you're fishing in an ice thing, I mean, I'm kind of thrown off by the logistics. How does the fish come out? Does it come up through, like, a little hole? I mean, if you make a big hole, isn't the whole ice going to just crack off and collapse underneath you? Well, anyway, I have a, a pretty confused mental image of it. Back to this, qualities. Um, you got to have flexibility too. And I don't mean literally like doing yoga, although I'm sure that's another good thing for your health and everything, but, um, we're talking about intellectual flexibility here. So, um, flexibility of mind, having an open mind and it's described as follows. It's the ability to evaluate and be open to conflicting views, but also having the capacity to change your mind or your plans. So the ability to change one's mind or plans when it's called on. Um, and just being open to alternative or conflicting ideas. <clears throat> Okay, so I mean, you've probably met people, or maybe some of us are a little bit like this ourselves, stubborn to a fault, you know, like you, you have a plan A, and you don't want to move off of plan A, even if it seems like it's clearly not going to work, you just keep doubling down on a failed course of action. That would not be being flexible, that would be inflexible, right? Um, or changing your mind, forget about changing your plans, but suppose you have an opinion on something, and evidence is coming forward, and it's been rationally and persuasively argued to you that you're, you have the wrong point of view on this. Um, even if you may harbor some personal doubts, if you've got this inflexibility of mind, you're never going to budge off your position. In fact, it may even cause you to double down more and more. But a good critical thinker is not so wedded to a given prior position of theirs that they cannot be moved off of it, that they can't change their mind. All that has to happen for your mind to change is for the evidence to show that your previous position is not uh, justified on the basis of the evidence. So critical thinkers aren't necessarily trying to preserve their original beliefs and never change them. They're seeking the truth. And sometimes the truth only comes through um, reconsideration. Of course, you know, we can make errors in judgment. And sometimes that's only revealed to us in the full light of experience and with new time and more information that comes forward later. So why would we be scared to or hesitant to revisit our previous positions in the light of new information and new arguments? Um, I think, in fact, it's actually a weakness, the kind of person who can't be having their mind or plans changed. Um, having that kind of stubborn inflexibility, in my view, shows that you're scared of ever being wrong. 
and that you're not actually committed to the pursuit of the truth, come what may, even when the truth is uncomfortable or forces you to reverse your previous position. So I think it actually takes strength to be the kind of person that says, you know, what I thought before, it wasn't right. And now I know better because I've reconsidered and looked at more of the facts. Um, so nobody should think that, hey, I'm weak if I've changed my mind. If someone convinced me that I had a point of view and it wasn't merited, con confessing that I was wrong is just a, is a confession of weakness. It's not. It's a strength. It shows that you have the integrity to pursue the truth, um, even when it means that you have to contradict your previous self. Um, and having an open mind to alternative ideas, not just shutting down alternative lines of thought or inquiry or contrary perspectives, but at least being open-minded enough to hear those points of view out and evaluate them with some degree of, you know, honesty and open-mindedness. Okay. So a good critical thinker is willing and able to change their mind and plans if it's needed, if it's called for. They don't just keep on going forward with a failed course of action or a belief that has shown its limitations. <clears throat> Next up, we've got Open-minded skepticism, yet another important quality of a good critical thinker. Open-minded skepticism. Um, Sid Hartman was the first general manager. Oh, you talking about, like, I'm, I'm, I'm lost. Is this a Minnesota reference? Well, I'll, I'll find out. But I feel like who's the, who's the team? I'm. That's all you, Paul. Sorry, buddy. Minneapolis Lakers. Okay, okay. Now I've got you. <clears throat> that's been too long in the past. Open-minded skepticism, guys. There's sort of a dual emphasis to this definition. In a way, they almost are tearing us in different directions. So let me make that clear. The open-minded skeptic is the kind of person who would not believe something unless it could be proven beyond some kind of reasonable doubt. Yeah, I know, Lakers were first Minneapolis. Some, they still sometimes wear the old throwback jerseys of, I think, baby blue. Um, Open-minded skepticism. So one will not believe something unless it can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So that's the skeptical part of the definition, but, and here comes the open-minded part, but it keeps an open mind until then. Okay. It says, open-minded skepticism. One will not believe something unless it can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, and at the same time, they do keep an open mind until, until that proof arrives, if it ever does. So um, good critical thinkers, as you guys know, are not just gullible and willing to believe anything that they hear. A belief can only pass through to the belief system of a really good critical thinker if it's provable. It's got to have some kind of proof behind it. If there's no proof, if there's all kinds of good reasons to doubt that it's true, then the critical thinker will say, you know what, I've got to remain a little bit skeptical about your claim. I need better evidence. So you can't just say to the person, yo, there's aliens out there in outer space. The critical thinker would say, maybe there are, maybe there aren't, but I really can't say I agree until there's better conclusive evidence to show this. At the same time though, and then we get to this part, the same good critical thinker that is skeptical will keep an open mind. So they don't rule any possibilities out before having evaluated the evidence, um, but they're not going to commit to either side of a question or debate until the evidence makes it somewhat persuasively proven. So, you know, it's like, okay, I'm not going to say there's no aliens. I'm not gonna say that there are. I just keep an open mind uh, awaiting better conclusive evidence. So good critical thinkers believe waiting until they, they wait until there's good evidence to form a belief in something. They don't put the cart before the horse, as it were. Believe something and then get evidence for it later. No, no, no. You you follow the evidence wherever it leads you. You don't have like a, a favored position or an unfavorable position. Your position is just whatever the evidence indicates. Um, but in the absence of such clear and conclusive evidence, it's like the jury is out. I'm not going to make a judgment on the case unless I have proof that can show it one way or the other. In the absence of such proof, you don't shut down either possibility. You just say, well, I'm waiting for more established proof of this, but I'm going to keep an open mind either way until I see that proof. Okay. 
So like if you're on a jury, for example, you're, you're not going to say, well, I already have committed myself to guilt or innocence. You're only going to cast the vote in the jury depending on what you think the evidence shows. But until that time, you are going to keep an open mind and not prejudge the facts. And that's whether it's in a court of law or just in everyday life, you should have that habit of mind. You know, wait for the facts and evidence, follow them wherever they lead. But until such time, try to maintain an open mind about those different questions. Okay, so um, we're pretty much running to the end of today's time period, which is fine. I've got more notes on Chapter 1. We'll pick up from here when we come back next uh, Tuesday. This Thursday, you do have your homework to turn in, but there will not be a YouTube live stream because of the whole Flex Day holiday that I was mentioning at the beginning of today's meeting. So make sure to send me your homework, and I'll be grading them over the weekend. I'll send you the answer key for it over the weekend, and I'll be in touch with you over the weekend about the upcoming quiz next week. But um, we still have one more lecture before then. The quiz is next Thursday, so we're going to finish our Chapter 1 notes Tuesday next week, and that'll set us up for the upcoming quiz. In the meantime, make sure to turn in your homework on Thursday, and I'll send you a confirmation that I received it. By the end of today, if you've sent me a message and I haven't yet replied, I'm going to clear my inbox by the end of the day, so you'll get a response from me today. All right, everybody. So, yeah, thanks again. Um, appreciate all of your guys' help and participation. Yeah, you know, open book because um, you're by yourself in your house, so I can't really – I'm not going to put a camera on you or anything else. Yeah, it's fine to have an open book. Um, wow, NBA, NFL. Well, there was also Bo Jackson. And wasn't there um, – who's other? Ken Griffey? No, not Ken Griffey. There's a couple of dual uh, sport athletes. I know Bo, Bo knows is one of them. And um, I'm forgetting the other one, but it was, it was baseball, I think, and football. Uh, yeah, anyways, trivia time. Welcome and thanks again, guys. So I'll see you then on Thursday uh, – not Thursday. I'll see you on Tuesday. In the meantime, Deion Sanders, that's right. Deion Mater. <laughs> funny. Okay, guys, well – Again, thanks so much. Take care, and I'll see you next time. Let's be in touch over email, and make sure to give me that homework before Thursday at, uh, at 1245. All right, then. Bye-bye. Take care. See you soon.